everyone, here we are. We're gonna finish up 1 Peter. We only have two more chapters. Then we're gonna do 2 Peter, which is one of my all-time favorites, and that's only three chapters, so let's get going. 1 Peter chapter four. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, Arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. So if you've suffered enough to the point of your body, trust me, you know what evil is, and you're, you're definitely going to be living your life for God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So God's ready. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead. Remember, Jesus went and preached in hell after the death of his body. He went in the spirit and even went into the depths of the earth to hell and preached to the condemned spirits there. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Okay, I'm sorry, I told you wrong. There is a point, yes, where we read in the last chapter that Jesus does go down and preach to the people in hell, the condemned spirits. This is about people who are just dead, okay? And they are going to awake to judgment. Uh, or, you know, whatever, yeah. Some to everlasting glory, some to everlasting shame. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Okay, I'm going to look into that and bring it back to you because that's a little confusing to me. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms, meaning different gifts and different people. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. In other words, watch your mouth, okay, and speak really weighty good words. To each other. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you. So whatever you're going through, don't be surprised if you're a believer, okay? As though something strange were happening to you. So don't be surprised about this fiery trial like something strange is happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler, not even as a busybody. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household, and if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who don't obey the gospel of God? And quote, if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? End quote. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Now remember, there was persecution, physical persecution of Christians in those days. Many of them, uh, I'm not sure if it was in the same time period, but shortly thereafter, within the next few hundred years at least, I know maybe within the hundred years, they were put in coliseums to be eaten by lions. They were used as human torches at Nero's dinner parties. So, you know, he, he's talking, and, and even to this day, he's talking to some of us who might suffer physically, okay? Not to be scary, 
once again. Just, you know, just bear and, and trust. Chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness to Christ's sufferings. Because he was there, right? Peter was there. Who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Excuse me. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because, quote, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. End quote. I just quoted that to a sister in the Lord today. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Don't think you're alone, people, okay? We're all going through it. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, you think to yourself, well, why do we have to suffer? We're going to suffer because we're not like the rest of the world. So even if Jesus were not, not the Lord and was, you know, even if there was no God, if you go against the system in the world, you're going to be persecuted and you're going to suffer. In other words, you suffer to be a good person in this world because the world is wicked. Okay? And thank God we're not alone suffering for nothing. We have a Lord. We have Jesus who is our captain, who's watching over us and who is marking every suffering we go through. And our enemies will be put under our feet. Okay? Okay? So you pay a price when you do the right thing in this world because the world is evil, okay? With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, we don't know because we do know that Peter was married, but we don't know if, if he, when he says, so does my son Mark, if it's actually his son, Mark, or if it's just another brother or possibly Mark who wrote the gospel, one of the gospels. All right, let's get into 2 Peter now. This is the first chapter. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You're doing that as you're stumbling forward, failing forward in, in working out your salvation with fear and trembling, respect, okay, towards the Lord who can, who has the power of life and death for us, okay? So you are doing good, all right? And it says here, to you may participate in the divine nature having escaped, excuse me, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Though through these he's given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Being a good per you know, uh, doing good works, serving, serving, serving others. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Okay, that's what I meant to say is you know, you're you're swimming upstream, folks, because you're you're doing good in a world that is extremely evil, okay? And it always has been, all right? For this reason, make effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness. 
and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For, you, it, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever doesn't have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. You got a fresh start every day. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'll always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body meaning his physical body, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. So he was told, your time is almost up. Okay, and I believe the Lord tells all the saints that, uh, that when it gets close, the Lord says it's coming. Okay, but at least we see that quite often in the Bible. Um, and I'll make every effort to see that after my departure, you'll always be able to remember these things. And it's written down right here in his letters that are preserved. For we didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Remember, Peter was there at the transfiguration. Remember him and John and James went with Jesus up the hill and Jesus was seen in the, was taken up into the clouds and was standing and talking to Moses and Elijah. Or I think both of them. All right. Uh, for we didn't follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from, the Lord, from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Okay, I jumped the gun again, but there's the story. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark space until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And the morning star is Jesus. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people. Now listen to this carefully, okay? This is the chapter I love in Peter. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In other words, people will start making fun of Christians and their message. And we've seen plenty of these teachers that have made Christians and Christ look foolish, not in a good way, okay? And because they've been arrested for doing all kinds of crazy stuff that they shouldn't have been doing and because they've stolen money, you know, and they, they thieve from widows and poor women who think they're buying their way into heaven. This stuff has made Christianity uh, fall into disrepute, okay? Um, uh, they will secretly, excuse me. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. All those stories about, oh, I went to heaven and I talked with Jesus. Run the other way when people tell you they've gone to heaven. Why would they go and not you? God would make us all look mad if we were all transferred back and forth to heaven. And that's what these teachers, they write books about it my five days in heaven with the Lord. I mean, one pastor was saying, oh, in the Lord's eyes. And well, you know, come on. Jesus and the Lord, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all in all. They're, they're one person. So how do you look at the Lord in his eye? You're not supposed to look at the Lord and live. These people are liars, okay? When people tell you, I saw angels, I saw... Now, I have had some encounters in my life 
But the one encounter I had where I knew there was an angel there speaking something to me that I needed to know, he didn't walk into my bedroom while I was fully awake. That's not what happened. I was woken up in the spirit at about three in the morning and it was a prophecy the angel gave me regarding my daughter because my daughter's been wayward for almost 44 years, okay? She's beyond human aid. She's still doing alcohol and probably drugs. It's terrifying, okay? She's completely self-will run riot. And I had an experience when I first took custody of my granddaughter. I woke up at three in the morning and there was someone at the end of the bed, but it didn't scare me because it was in the spirit that I was awake. I was as awake as I am right now talking to you, but I wasn't with my body, okay? This was a spiritual, supernatural experience. I wasn't in heaven. I wasn't seeing Jesus. I wasn't wide awake and an angel walked into the living room. No, run from those kinds of testimonies, run. What I'm telling you, uh, could be seen as a dream experience, except that I know I was fully there, okay, in the way. So it was, a vi it was another vision, okay, and it was just given to me at night when I was asleep. And I was woken up in the spirit, and I said, there was someone at the end of the bed, but I was not afraid. And he was a very blonde-haired, blue-eyed person. Like his eyes were, you know, very clear, everything. I got up in the spirit, and I went and stood with him at the end of the bed. Now, you have to understand, I had the crib with Juliet, who was only just under two years old. They were foot to foot. My The foot of my bed had about a two foot space, and then the foot of her crib was there, okay? This is how young I got Juliet, my granddaughter, okay? I mean, I diaper, uh, I, I potty trained her, I did all the stuff, okay, with her. So here I am and I'm speaking with this person and I was not afraid and I remember I tested the spirit. I wish to God I could remember what I said, but I tested him to make sure that I was not having a demonic visit. And uh, whatever he said to me made me know I was speaking to someone from heaven, okay? He didn't have big, huge wings, none of that. And the word that came to me was that he was a centurion. I didn't even really know what a centurion was, but that was the word that came to me about this person. And the first thing I said to him was, is she going to die? Because I was so scared for my daughter, because I had custody, because my daughter was a crack addict and a heroin addict and a prostitute and everything else. And I was so in love with my daughter and so terrified, that was all I could think about. She was all of 25 years old and gorgeous. And I said to this person, I said, without any introduction, is she going to die? And he said to me, she will not die. She will have a life altering experience and she will serve the Lord. And while he was speaking, I was seeing things, but I'm not going to reveal what they were. But I have a fair idea, I think, of what may happen to her. But hey, if somebody from heaven visits you and answers your question and tells you that your daughter is not going to die, that she will have a life-altering experience and she will serve the Lord, then you better believe it. And I've hung on to that dream for years and years, that happened 20 years ago, and I've hung on to it. And what was interesting was I was in the park with Juliet one day, we were living in Seattle, and I was at the Seattle Center in a certain area of it. And I bumped into a gentleman, we started talking, and he said he was a pastor. And so we started a conversation. In this long conversation, I told him the experience I had just recently had, and he said, in your mind, you need to set up an altar the way the old kings did and the prophets. Remember, they used to set up, uh, Noah got out and built an altar out of stones. He said, you need to set up an altar or a marker in your mind and you hang on to that. Every time you doubt, you go back in your mind to that altar, to that stone marker that you've put up, marking the prophecy that was given to you. So even though I lose faith, I remember what was told to me. And if God saw fit to send someone with that message to me, 
then you can be sure it's going to happen. And I have to hold myself sometimes and think very deeply about that message so that I will believe it. Because we're human and our faith falters and it's hard to trust. Okay? But this was not going to heaven in a trolley car or however they go. This was none of that. This was a vision. Okay? So I guess maybe I've had three visions in my life. And each one was very, very important to me at that period of time extremely important to me continuing to be able to keep going okay all right in their greed these teachers will exploit exploit you with fabricated stories their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping you know they're selling books on this stuff they're getting your money okay and they're getting con you know they're getting um uh parishioners through these false stories who give them money for if God didn't spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, which was created for the angels originally, by the way, it wasn't created for man. It's very sad that man goes there. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if he didn't spare the ancient world when he brought the flood of, uh, uh, on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteousness for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desires of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. That's what happened in Lot's day. The men of, of Sodom were saying send the angels out to us send those two men out and they were angels and let us have sex with them it's written folks bold and arrogant they're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings yet even angels although they're stronger and more powerful don't heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the lord they just they just destroy them they don't bother yelling at them or heaping abuse they just they just do whatever the lord's asked but these people blaspheme in matters they don't understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. You know, that's funny that it says this. They are like unreasoning animals. I have a neighbor here who came to me. I bumped into her in the hallway and she just came and stood in front of me. And I was like, hi. And then I saw tears coming into her eyes. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And she just sobbed. She had to put her dog down because the dog attacked her and, and bloodied her hand. And this was a new dog and it was part Cocker Spaniel. And Cocker Spaniels, when they're overbred, get something called shy sharpness. And it's a fear mixed with um, uh, territorialism. It's like a, com a bad combination and it causes viciousness. And it's very specific to Cocker Spaniels. And she had a cockapoo and the dog was only 10 months old and her heart is broken. But when I saw the pictures of her hand, this dog did a number on her. So I told her, you know, I actually know, I know about this. I had a Cocker Spaniel that had this problem. It's from overbreeding. And so it's just funny that it says they're like unreasoning animals. I mean, her dog was turning on her. It was happening over and over and she finally just gave up. She took it to the SPCA and she said, this is what's happening. They said, we can't adopt the dog out. We're gonna have to put the dog down. And she was a good husbandman to the dog. And she said, okay, because who wants to give a dog to an unsuspecting family that, ha that has a predisposition to viciousness? Not all cockers, okay? This happens to some. I got one like that and she got one. And this dog tore her hand up. Her fingernails are black from how hard it was beating, uh, biting her. And she had tears on her hand. 
I said, honey, you did the right thing. And her grief is so profound, but I think part of it was she just felt guilty. And I said, look, they are like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct. When it comes to animals, we have to be good farmers, okay? We have to husband them, we have to take care of them. And the ones that aren't working have to be put down sometimes. That's the hard part of our dominion over the creatures of this earth. We were given that, that command to take care of the animals and some of the animals don't make it. And very few, but some of them for weird reasons, okay? And if you remember in the Old Testament, the Lord said he is gonna require that the animals that kill human beings, they're gonna stand in front of God and explain why. They're gonna be held accountable for killing human beings. Animals are never to attack humans, never. We are their keepers. And yeah, that was just a really hard thing today. I spent hours with her because she needed to be comforted and she needed to understand that she did nothing wrong. And she didn't think she was gonna to have to put the dog down, but they're like, you know, she knew she couldn't keep the dog. And I said, look, God sent you to that place where they put the dog down. God made the decision that the dog was not fit. Oh, what a hard, hard thing. And so here we're reading, they are like, un let's read it all again. Bold and arrogant, they're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings, yet even angels, although they're stronger and more powerful, don't heap abuse on such beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But these people blaspheme in matters they don't understand. They're like unreasoning animals, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they've done. Isn't that funny that I've read two, one scripture that I shared with a sister today about God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble or favor to the humble. And then this thing, but like my whole day is in these, what we're reading tonight. Uh, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they've done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight, their blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable, they're experts in greed and a cursed brood. And you can see that if you look at a lot of the televangelists on TV, I really shudder for some of you guys because occasionally I see that you'll put posts up on your feed that are from some of these really weird televangelists. I'm not gonna name them because I'm not condemning you, but some of them are really vicious people. I've heard some of them speak things that are so unkind and vicious towards the body of Christ. And yet I, I see on your feed, some of you have them up. And I'm like, oh my goodness, get these false teachers out of here. If they're making up stuff and preaching anything to you other than the word, get rid of them. I'm gonna say it again. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning, but seduce the unstable. They can seduce you for your money, your time, your talents. They're experts in greed and a cursed brood. They've left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer. And we remember the story of Balaam in the Old Testament, who loved the wages of wickedness but he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey. Remember his donkey wouldn't move because the donkey saw the angel and Balaam started beating him and the donkey's like, I've served you all this time. Why are you beating me? The Lord opened a donkey's mouth. So let me tell you this. If you're looking at some of those crazy pastors, the Lord can speak out of the mouth of a donkey. So some of those crazy pastors, let's just equate them to a donkey. I say that humbly to, to make a point, okay? I heard my friend Pastor Wayne said 30 years ago, he said, look, just because the pizza delivery boy is drunk doesn't mean you'll get drunk off the pizza. Think about that. Just because the delivery boy is drunk doesn't mean you'll get drunk off the pizza. Sometimes the Lord will open the mouth of a donkey and give you the good word. I just worry when I, when I worry that you might be following some of these people. You can get a good word from them, yes. But when you throw your lot in with some of these churches of thousands of people. Something's wrong, people. Something's wrong with that, okay? It's a it's cult of personality. 
It's a cult of personality when they have this big famous pastor in there. That's a cult of personality. No one should be taking glory like that. One of these guys whips out an electric guitar and starts playing with a bare chest, pretending he's a rock. Uh uh, no. And he's got what? 30,000 people with itching ears in there. Okay? A humble person doesn't need any of that. And if they get it, believe me, they're going to shrink really small so that Jesus can be glorified. Because we know Jesus had thousands of people following him. I don't know if he had 30,000. We know he had five and 10, probably 15,000. So the gospel can draw big crowds, but I'll bet you that in those big crowds, there's a lot of pew warmers and people that don't know Jesus and will not ever get the chance to know Jesus because they're following a, a, a shyster. All right, here we go. Who spoke, the donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These people are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. For they mouth empty, boastful words. And, and that's what I want to tell you. Very boastful. And by appealing, let's just say I'm a pastor and I have 30,000 people listening to me online. And I'm getting real heady and I'm just telling you all this stuff about me and me and me and me and me. And the word is kind of secondary. That's a cult of personality. You're here for the person. You're not here for the word of God. Now, a normal pastor, if they're in that situation, they shrink really tiny so that only Jesus can be seen. They don't take glory, okay? They're not cocky. All right. These people are springs without water, mists driven by a storm, blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words. And by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. So they just get out of the world and come into the church and then they jump right. It's like out of the frying pan into the fire. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. Remember I told you about the pastor who said that he found out a big pastor, well-known one, very wise. Now, he doesn't have a church of 30,000, but people know him online. He said the pastors in the highest places are having orgies. What? I couldn't believe it. While they promise them freedom, they themselves are slaves of depravity. For, quote, people are slaves to whatever's mastered them. End quote. If they've escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and, and are again entangled in it and overcome, they're worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. Quote, a dog returns to its vomit. End quote. End quote. A sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. End quote. All right. Last chapter. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. And following their own evil desires, they'll say, where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. They deliberately forget you ever met someone like that? I've met many. I know you have too. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. I, I just hate wickedness, people. I, I hate it. By, that, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. Next time it's going to be fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But don't forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord isn't slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. 
Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to die. It says perish, but I want to make it clear to you. But everyone to come to repentance. He doesn't want anyone to die. He wants everyone to come to repentance. That's God's desire. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Do you know how sad you'll be if you've wasted time and have never served the Lord when you see that happening? Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Get on it. As you look forward to the day of God and speed, it's coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Get it together with the Lord. Be reconciled to the Lord. Become holy. Become separated unto the Lord. Become righteous in right relationship with the Lord. Do it now. Don't waste time, okay? Your life's only going to get better if you bring the Lord into it and start serving him. I'm going to read it again. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. We know that such as the thing about women, teaching and keeping silent and bearing children, which ignorant and unstable people distort. People use these things to say the Bible isn't true. Just because we don't understand them does now, yet, doesn't mean it's not true, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction, like the one that says, oh, the Bible was made by man. I'm so tired of hearing that. Heaven will be not ever hearing the objections of the evil and unsaved and ungodly unbelievers. That will be heaven for me. As they do the other scriptures to their own destruction, I hate hearing the word of God perverted, and I know you do too. Therefore, dear friends, since you've been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I love you very much, and I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to bring you that scripture that we didn't understand, which was something about God preaching to the dead. Uh, they'll have to give account to him who is ready to, no, 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 wasn't that. I'll find it. I'm going to bring it back to you. Let's just see really quickly. I know I've kept you a few minutes over. Uh, let's just look really quickly at our next book. I believe it's John. I could be wrong. Let's look here. First John, not John the gospel, but let's see here. Uh, yes, I'm right. We have three books of John. They're all very short. So we're going to do first John, second John, third John. Then we have Jude and then we're in Revelation. I cannot wait. I love you very much and I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.